We're now going to look at the third component when discussing a time series graph, and that is looking at the residuals. So if we take a look at what is called the recomposed graph. So it's the pieces of the graph we've looked at before. So the long term trend and the seasonal effect, it gets recomposed, put back together onto the same graph. Then we can start to look at residuals. So there is a lot of information going on here. Um, and we'll just talk through the things that you already know. So the number of injuries that were caused by road accidents in New Zealand from 2011 through to 2017. This is the same data that we used on the seasonal um, video just before this one. So we'll, we've got data from each of the months for each of the years from 2011 through to 2017. So covering um, six years in total. So the first thing that you want to talk about was the first graph that you saw, which is the trend line. So it's the blue line, that dark blue right here. So that there is the long term trend. And that is calculated by working out moving averages. Um, so it takes the average of the points around it and then plots that average line throughout. Now you don't need to explain how that gets put together, but it's helpful to understand that with the long-term trend, it's taking the data points, which is the black line. So the raw data you can see underneath is this black line here. So that's the raw data. And to work out the trend line, it takes an average of the points around there, takes that average, and then it averages out those points near to a point that we want to plot and plots out what that average is there. And then it'll move along a little bit and it will take the next little group of raw data points, it will figure out their average and it will put that just there. And then it repeats this process all the way along. It'll take the next few data points and works out their average and plots that to create the long-term trend that we see running through the graph just here. The next thing to talk about was the um, seasonality on the graph, and that was easier done on the graph that separates out um, the, the seasonal effects um, throughout each of the years that you saw on the previous video. But when that, once that average seasonal effect has been worked out for each of the months, it gets put back onto this recomposed data um, on this graph here, and it gets plotted underneath on this seasonal um, section here. So each of these years has got the seasonal effect plotted underneath it and then repeated. You'll see that each of those years is exactly the same because that section is those averages from the graph that we saw of uh, working out the average seasonal effect per year. So, for example, this this peak that we see um, in there, I think it was month three, I might be remembering that wrong, but month three, let's say it peaks to the same amount every time because that is the average that was worked out across all of the years. So this is the expected seasonal things that are happening on our graph. That's what we expect to happen in each of the seasons. So we stick it onto the graph underneath the raw data so we can compare it to what happened. So the real data, the black line, we can compare what happened there with what we expected to happen from the seasonal averages. Which brings us to looking at the green line up here, which is the trend plus the seasonal component. OK, so this green line is taking the long term trend, so the blue line through here, and it, we, we take that blue line, so to, to, to predict a particular point or, or compare our model at a particular point, we take the blue line and then we look for what the seasonal effect should be at that point and add it together. So that blue line plus the seasonal effect gives us the green line. So the green line is what we expect to happen if the data was perfectly following the long term trend and the seasonal um, effect. So the two things that we've talked about already. So putting together the long term trend and adding on the seasonal effect gives us this green line that we see on the, the top 
of um, our recomposed data here all the way through our graph. So that's long term trend plus seasonal effect. It's kind of like taking that seasonal graph that's in orange underneath and then bending it so that it goes around the long term trend. Now, the point of doing that is to see whether our data fit our model well or not, or if there were times where it went quite different. So we can look at different periods on this graph and see where it fit, fit better than others and whether there were some unusual things that we want to talk about. Which brings us finally to our discussion of residuals. So the graph at the bottom, this red line that we've got, is residual. Now, residual means left over. So it's the leftover pieces. If we take the model and we find the difference between the model and what actually happened. So that red residual line is worked out by looking at the green line, which is what we expect to happen if the long term trend and the seasonal um, averages perfectly match our data. And then what happens on the black line and finding out the difference. So, for example, let's look at this point just here. So the green line is what we expected to happen, but the black line is what actually happened. And you can see that there's a difference between those two. So that difference, this amount here, gets plotted as the residual. And if we look down on the graph um, for that point there, we can see that we have our, our zero line runs through the middle here. OK, so that's the zero line. That's what there would be no difference if things matched perfectly. But this difference here where the data came out to be um, slightly below. So if we look at the green, the green is higher than the black. So we expected it to come out higher. The real data came out a little lower than we were expecting. So that's corresponding to um, the portion of the graph here that's dipping below that zero. So we get a negative there. I'll do another example just to, to show what we're talking about. If we take a look at, um, let's say, this point just here, and we compare the green and the black, they're actually very similar. Um, so th at that point there, the raw data matched what we expected it to. And if you track that down to the residual graph, you can see we get this residual of zero where that different or very close to zero, where the, the difference between what we expected to happen and what actually happened was very, very tiny, if anything at all. So if you go back and look at the data and work out how much that was, it would be a very, very small amount. So how is why is this useful? Why would we want to talk about it? So we can take a look at this residual graph and see how well our data matched the model that we've been using to talk about it. Um, if there's a lot of, uh, it's called noise on this residual graph, if it fluctuates a lot around like this, you've got things going up and down all over the place, then you know you've got a lot of differences, that you've got lots of things that were too high and too low compared to the model. So you know that the model didn't fit the data particularly well. If it's staying kind of around the zero line and it's not wavering too much, then you know that your model was a pretty good fit. Um, and it's it's going to give us more reliable predictions and um, things to talk about. So if we look at this particular one, have a think about what you think this residual graph is showing us. Does it mean that our model was particularly good or particularly bad somewhere in the middle? Does it fit better in some places than others? So one important thing to note is those gray lines that we've got just here on the top and the bottom. Now they make they mark a difference of 10%. So if things go 10% above or 10% below the long-term trend, um, then we count them as being unusual values. So anything that goes outside, so we've got some here that are much higher, we've got some here that are much lower, we've got some that go a little bit higher and lower, um, and other places where things go beyond that 10% threshold that we're looking for. If they go outside of that 10%, then we would want to comment on it. And if there's lots of places where it goes outside of 10%, it's not a particularly strong model. So with this one, it's not a particularly good fit. It's good enough that we can talk about it and find some useful things from it. 
but the kinds of judgments that we're making will have some reservations about because there are places where this model doesn't fit well at all. There are some places that fit better than others. So we can talk about that um, in different portions and split it up into its different sections too. So for example, we've got this section from here to here where it doesn't really go outside of the 10%. So in that time period there, we can say that the model is a better fit than say, for example, at the end here, where it fluctuates quite a lot and goes quite far out of 10%. So we might say something along the lines of in the recent years, it, it wasn't following the model, perhaps something has changed and the um, things that were affecting that data um, has had a change in it. And you'd want to go away and research what that, what might have happened to cause that data to be so different from um, the model that was tracking reasonably well before that. 